Okay, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. The view out the grill room windows here at the St. Francis Yacht Club could not be any better. Uh, right off the bat, let's hear from our Vice Commodore, Bill Dana. Come on up, Bill. Welcome, Bill Dana. Bill's right up here. And then Paul came, and if you'll bring a mic over to uh, Lynn. Welcome, Bill Dana. Yay. I uh, have a booming voice. So, um, welcome, everybody. Beautiful day. Unfortunately, it's wintertime. We should be having storms, but uh, maybe it'll come around. But it uh, might seem like kind of a quiet time for sailing this time of year, but uh, but actually, for a lot of you who don't know, we have a, uh, a challenge group that we send about two dozen sailors to different challenge events around the country and around the world uh, throughout the year. And so we're in the big uh, planning phases now, but we've already had one group of masters who went down to do some team racing in St. Petersburg. Uh, so there's, there's always a lot going on. If you're uh, not aware of it, you can get involved if you're a team racer or uh, just uh, support, uh, support the guys. It's actually quite a lot of fun. Uh, of course, San Francisco Cup is around the corner in March. And uh, one last thing, I need to plug the St. Francis Sailing Foundation. Uh, great organization, uh, has their, um, their auction, annual auction, March 3rd. I don't know if it's sold out or not, but uh, if you're interested, go. It's, uh, it supports a lot of our youth sailors going to events, um, some aspiring Olympians and some uh, local sailing centers like Treasure Island Sailing Center. So in um, any case, that's it. Welcome, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Bill. And next, uh, we want to hear from our good member, Lynn Monroe. We're, you got the mic working there, Lynn? Touch it at the bottom, if that's it. Jim, you got to, Bobby, you got to make sure that happens. Okay, this is a little story I think you ought to know. <clears throat> that was that was her husband. That was my husband. Husband like grown. Well, you know, we've been very excited about coming to this program today. And Bruce has been talking about Doolittle and Jimmy Doolittle, and we've been talking all about it. So on Sunday, <clears throat> he said, I need to go take you over to the movie because the movie Doolittle is playing. So all the... All the way over to the theater, we talked about the history of it and Jim, everything, FDR, the whole bombing of Pearl Harbor and how we needed to have the uh, general feeling of the United States get up again because we were pretty down. So we talked about the whole thing, got the senior discount, got, Bruce, got Bruce's um, uh, caption machine for the, th for the theater. We watched the coming attractions, and then when the uh, actual movie came on, I looked up. It was a hippopotamus looking at a doctor. It was Dr. Doolittle, <laughs> not Jimmy. So, <laughs> I know. So, <laughs> and, so, the best part of this is I said to Bruce, I promise I'll never tell anybody about this. So the first thing I did was call my daughter-in-law the minute we got in the car. And I thought all of you might get a big bang out of it, too. We did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lynn Monroe. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers in the future. Uh, come on by on, in May. We'll hear from Paul.
uh, Kayard, our chairman of the board and the first sailor, this was just announced last week, to be inducted into the uh, Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame, which is wonderful. Good on you, Paul. <clears throat> Also in May, also in May, Steve Tishia, chairman of the America's Cup Hall of Fame committee, will be here. Jack Griffin, who is a blogger and has a very well-regarded and authoritative blog called Cup Experience. Don Martin, the commander of the Single-Headed Sailing Society, who created the biggest race in America, who's raced in the Three Bridge Fiasco. Fellow fiascoers uh, know that it's a huge race, several hundred boats. 400 boats, and uh, so we'll hear from the Commodore. Um, we'll also hear from Mike Martin and Adam Lowry in April. They were just inducted into the Rolex. They just be, were named Rolex Yachtsman of the Year, the two of them. Um, uh, then in April the 8th, we'll have a very special program because I have recruited the 96-year-old, a 96-year-old Marine private first class who was on the beach at Iwo Jima, literally. And he will be here to give us as a first-hand account as you can get. And he's an amazing guy. I met him recently and uh, recruited him. Uh, Kevin Kelly will be here April 1st to talk all about the high-tech way you keep the bottom of your boat fast. Jim Hancock, founder of the Sailing Science Center, will be here in March. And then uh, uh, next week will be Chuck Adams, former ad man and owner of the Pittsburgh Penguins. And um, um, then those of you who have the uh, sort of like Walter Mitty idea that you want to race around the world, you'll have a chance to listen to uh, Will Stokely. Will Stokely is, in fact, part of the Clipper Yacht Race, where you can charter to sail and race on a race around the world. And then uh, March the 4th, we'll have Mikhail Vinikoff, who's uh, at 120 combat missions uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, was named the number one special forces uh, competition in the world, and who founded a new foundation called Ranger One, Ranger Road, uh, where handicapped veterans get a chance to challenge themselves anew. And next week, the head of the San Francisco Coast Guard will be here to talk all about Marie Bird. We talk all about the Coast Guard in San Francisco. So great programs coming up. A little bit about our speaker today. So imagine that you're five years of age and your parents put you in an electric boat in Snow Lake. And you get fascinated by this whole idea. You're floating and yet, you know, how is this thing going and how are you able to move yourself around? And at age 17, our speaker joined the Navy. Wasn't really old enough to join the Navy, but he joined the Navy in the Reserve Officer Candidate School at... Um, his father, always fascinated with boats, was constantly talking about the Navy. So our friend then goes back to uh, Berkeley, uh, gets himself a uh, bachelor's degree in international relations, an honors program in international relations. And like most guys, immediately uh, runs over to Europe, spends a bunch of time in, with, in foreign aid programs and for the State Department, comes back, gets himself a JD, gets himself a law degree at Hastings, uh, goes on to become a full Bright scholar and have international practice of law and at about 10 years of age saw the movie 30 seconds over Tokyo and got fascinated so all through this this odyssey that I've just described he's thinking about this guy Jimmy Doolittle and the guts it took to fly over uh, you know Japan with less than one year after they've attacked us and so I don't think I could find a more authoritative expert on this whole subject which I know is of interest to many of us so please welcome our Bruce uh, Janagi come on up Bruce thank you mate What a great pleasure to be here, and especially to see so many Corinthians who are in the audience. Uh, I was a Corinthian for a number of years, and once you're a Corinthian, you're always a Corinthian. There is a, another organization that uh, hangs on to you for the rest of your life, and that is uh, the Navy. And I know there's a few of us here who have retired from the Navy. The sheet of information talks about my being a former naval captain. Um, 
I am not a former naval captain. I am a retired naval captain. And when you, when you receive retired pay, folks should realize you're subject to recall to active duty. And this fits in with the talk today because I came in as a reservist and was back and forth to active duty and so was Jimmy Doolittle. And I explained to an audience recently that the military gains a tremendous amount from the civilian employment of the reservists, as you'll see or as you'll hear when we talk about Jimmy Doolittle, he offered a great deal because he was working around the world on various projects and at the same time reporting back to Hap Arnold, his boss, the whole time. Another one who did that was, um, um, was uh, Slim. And Slim was uh, our, our pilot that flew across the Atlantic for the uh, very first time and was a very controversial figure uh, in American history. And let me get started with the talk. And before I do, I would like to say that if everything goes well today, I will take full credit for it. And if, <laughs> and if anything goes wrong, thank you, sir. If anything goes wrong, I would like to point out my dear friend Magnus Levicki, who was, who is, who is my, my personal hero, and he has been responsible for causing me to write a novel in which he is a protagonist, and causing me to become a, a somewhat proficient sailor on his boats at the Corinthian Yacht Club. Um, and thank you very much, Magnus. So the first question is, why me? In spite of that introduction, the last assignment I had with the Navy was to teach leadership to prospective commanding officers. And I looked at what I was expected to do, and I said, my goodness, this has got a lot to do with combat leadership. And Admiral, I've never been in combat. And he said, well, you're a good teacher. You've got a lot of experience teaching people things and I think you'll figure out how to do it. So I said, thank you very much. And to compensate, what I did was I set about organizing my Heroes Club. I got together a number of people with incredible backgrounds and experiences and brought them in as guest speakers in the programs that I was running. Some of these people included a PT boat skipper who was a uh, colleague of uh, John Kennedy and led the rescue effort for John Kennedy. I actually had him as a speaker at the Corinthian about five years ago. He went on to have intense combat experiences in Okinawa and he was one of the few people, Ted Robinson is his name if you're interested, and Ted had incredible insights into what it took to make really difficult decisions where you had to have people sacrificed if you went one way and you had to have people sacrificed if you went another way and how did you make those decisions? Another fellow was an African-American steward who grew up on a pig farm in Willows, California, and his family was too poor in the 30s to keep him at home. So he went off and he joined the Navy and found himself shooting at Japanese aircraft on the morning of December 7th, 1941. And then he was immediately pulled aboard an old riveted World War I submarine, which left Pearl Harbor. So while Pearl Harbor was still smoking and in flames, this little submarine, riveted World War I submarine, headed off to fill up on fuel and go directly to Tokyo Bay. With its choice of capital ships sitting in the harbor, the um, sub launched all of its torpedoes and all of them were duds. And um, they were chased by obviously an incensed Japanese fleet and the little diesel sub sat on the bottom of the harbor for what seemed an eternity and then managed to slip out and get back in time for a breakfast line he remembered at the Royal Hawaiian being served by Eleanor Roosevelt. This fellow was an African American who the whole time he was underway was told, was requested by his captain many times to sign a change of race 
form that the Navy had because he was only supposed to be a steward and he was running the submarine in various capacities. And he said, how am I going to do that? So, um, so this got me interested in focusing on real heroes and heroism and to look at the stark reality of those heroes who confronted and responded unhesitatingly to difficult circumstances by putting everything on the line. And this led me to a closer look at the war in the Pacific and its most courageous figures. So I submit to you today that against impossible odds, the war in the Pacific was decided within a year by a handful of genuine heroes. And I further submit that FDR and Jimmy Doolittle were possibly the two bravest Americans then living and that their bravery and leadership was an enormous part of the viral contagion that won the war, giving rise to the likes of John Bazelon fighting triumphantly against the Japanese, against uh, these incredible odds in the jungles of Guadalcanal. So my talk today stems from discovering that the Doolittle Raid encompassed so much more than many of us were led to believe with the film 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. It was actually a series of very effective precision bombing runs over carefully selected targets spread across four cities and military facilities that lasted a full hour and included damaging important war production facilities and even included damaging an aircraft carrier in dry dock, which was critically important to the war effort. Jimmy Doolittle personally designed everything from the fuel to collapsible rubber fuel tanks to the engine carburation, even to the design and procurement of the two 500-pound incendiary devices which each plane carried in addition to two 500-pound high-explosive bombs. You can have a look at the slide right now and see the B-25 Mitchell bombers aboard the Hornet. You're going to see a timeline film shortly which will depict the departure from the San Francisco Bay and describe to you the mission in some detail. Um, well, we can do that. Um, I, I want to just move along with some of the pictures as we have them in order. This is another shot of the B-25 Mitchell bombers on the Hornet heading out into the Pacific. And in the distance, you can see a cruiser behind the destroyer. And the heavy cruiser we decided was the Vincennes, which by coincidence had aboard Ron Young's father heading out. Ron was unaware that the father was accompanying the Doolittle Raid, but in fact he was. And that particular cruiser was lost at Guadalcanal, and that story was one that was shared uh, to Ron by his dad. In this picture, you can see Jimmy Doolittle attaching a medal he received from the Japanese government in the 30s, and he's attaching it to the fins of a bomb as a little remembrance of what they can do with that particular medal that they gave him. This one shows Jimmy Doolittle and his co-pilot Dick Coles, and we'll have a word more about Dick Coles, who just passed away last April at the age of 103. So the Raiders were intending to benefit from the cover of darkness but had to launch ahead of schedule and a full 200 miles further away than their intended 450 mile run to their targets. That put the 16 Raider B-25 Mitchell bombers over Japan at high noon in clear skies and in full pursuit by Japanese interceptors. They flew in at treetop level quickly rose to 1,500 feet when they dropped their ordnance and then dove back down to hug the skyline of Tokyo and the other cities that were bombed. 
Jimmy Doolittle's incredible piloting not only evaded and outran the pursuers, but allowed his crews to actually shoot down a number of the Japanese aircraft. Tokyo Gas and Electric, Japan Special Steel, the Mitsubishi aircraft plant in Nagoya, military barracks, oil tanks, and ship repair facilities were all successfully bombed. Amazingly, 15 of the 16 Raider aircraft delivered their payloads and 16, all of them, escaped Japanese skies unscathed. Let me see if we can now show. I'd like you to see the bomber that was used, the B-25 Mitchell bomber. And for that, Ron is going to help me. So this will give you an idea of what this bomber looked like. It was uh, designed and went into production in 1939. At, at 300 miles an hour, it actually lost some of the fighters that the Japanese sent up to take it down. saw when they looked up on that particular noontime on April 18th. Yes. 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 I think we're going to come in for a landing, but I'll, I'll move it ahead in just a moment. I'm going to, I'm going to show you some pictures in a little while of the evolution of these aircraft and how much they changed during the 1930s. 1932, they were still using biplanes. They were using biplanes right up really until the beginning of World War II. Okay, that gives you a feel for it. Let's see if we can move forward. So as you can tell, um, Ron is technically challenged, and I help him whenever he needs it. <laughs> whenever he needs it, I lend a hand. So the question, the question then becomes: Let's see here. If we can, are we moving forward with these slides? Mm -hmm. I think he should just stay next to me. <laughs> What but it's but nothing's happening. I, I've never had a program that didn't have problems whenever technology's been involved. Okay. So here's a picture of Doolittle with his gathered crews after they landed in Japan with some of the Japanese, uh, pardon me, the Chinese rescuers. Okay, who was this 45-year-old flying ace? He was 45 years old at the time of this mission. 
aviation speed record, ho record holder. How did a five foot four inch kid from Alameda organize such a masterful and successful effort to strike back at the heart of Japan within four months of Pearl Harbor and amidst a horrifying series of allied surrenders across the Far East? What became of Doolittle and his courageous fellow pilots and crews, all brave volunteers gathered from an airfield in Pendleton, Oregon? In delving into this, we're going to discover some interesting lessons. And I'm an old professor, so you're going to have to bear with me while I give you a few lessons before we see the actual timeline. When no good option is presented, choose the boldest plan. That's what FDR chose to do and what Doolittle was prepared to deliver. And if a plan doesn't exist, create it yourself and don't be daunted by what others consider impossible. Always improvise, I'm going to hold this one right here, always improvise and stretch the envelope. Doolittle's record for flying speed and aeronautical advancement were unsurpassed. He led the way in flying on instruments, opened the door to all weather and night flying, and was Dr. Doolittle. He received the first doctorate in aeronautical engineering from, NI from MIT. Expect the most of yourself and others you select for your team. With upbeat enthusiasm and true leadership, miracles can be achieved. Doolittle always wore a confident smile and charmed nearly everyone he met, including a personal friend of ours who had milk and cookies waiting for him after his flights. The other pilots drank, but Jimmy liked his milk and cookies. Don't stifle daring and creativity. Doolittle was always at the edge of the envelope, risking court-martial. As a civilian pilot in 1937, this again, he was a reservist at this point, before coming back on active duty. As a civilian pilot, he was fined $500 and had his pilot's license suspended for 45 days for, quote, navigating an aircraft at an altitude below 1,000 feet over a congested area. As commanding general of the 12th, 15th, and 8th Air Forces to inspire his air wings, he continually violated orders by leading some of the most dangerous missions personally, even though he was privy to the super secret ultra decoding. He was the envy of his like-minded pal Georgie, who always felt constrained, and Georgie was George Patton. For the Navy, the added lesson of the Doolittle Tokyo Raid was the proper integration of submarines, surface units, and air power. It would later prove decisive in the coming Battle of Midway just two months later, and at, in, June, um, at the, and, and in June, and at Guadalcanal in August. Finally, two other lessons are presented. Be flexible in the face of unexpected surprises. Doolittle originally planned to fly to Vladivostok and turn the planes over to Russia as part of Lend-Lease. But the Russians didn't want to jeopardize their neutrality with Japan at the time and refused to accept the planes. Against his explicit direction, civilian mechanics at Sacramento's McClellan Field changed the carburation on one of the airplanes, causing it to consume too much fuel. Then Army intelligence failed to take into account the international dateline when alerting friendly Chinese to receive the flights, so the raiders unant arrived unanticipated a day early. And last, but vitally important, never give up on sheer luck to see you through. Leaving the clear skies over Japan and heading to the Chinese coast, severe weather and strong headwinds meant the planes would have to ditch, never making landfall. But then miraculously, the headwinds turned into strong tailwinds and pushed them over so that most of them landed safely on the coast of China. Let's have a look now at the timeline, and for that, I will see if I can do that. <clears throat> 
but I have a feeling my dear friend, who's becoming even dearer by the moment, <laughs> will help us with this. Get to the timeline now. That's it. 42. The USS Hornet aircraft carrier steams under the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and heads out to sea with her escort fleet. 16 B-25 Mitchell medium bombers can be seen on her flight deck. The locals assume the bombers are simply being transported to Hawaii. After all, bombers of that size are surely far too large to be able to actually take off from an aircraft carrier. In December 1941, the Empire of Japan attacked the U.S. Navy base at Pearl Harbor, bringing the United States into World War II. Simultaneously, Japan also took the U.S. territories of Guam, the Philippines, and Wake Island. The American people were furious at these attacks on their territories and demanded revenge. President Roosevelt inquired about the feasibility of bombing raids on Japan. The U.S. needed a morale boost. However, the loss of airfields on the occupied Pacific Islands rendered the U.S. unable to reach Japan with the range of its conventional bomber air power. At a naval airfield in Virginia, testing was carried out whereby the outline of the deck of an aircraft carrier was drawn out on a runway, and medium bombers attempted to take off within the required distance of 467 feet. It was possible with major modifications, but only just. An attempt in the high seas of the Pacific Ocean would be quite a different matter. Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle, an engineer before the war and now famous military test pilot, sketched out a plan where medium bombers would take off from an aircraft carrier off the coast of Japan and strike the greater Tokyo area. Landing back on the aircraft carrier after the raid would be impossible, so he considered that the strike force would continue west after their raid and land in the Soviet Union turning the aircraft over to the Soviet Air Force as lead lease. However, while the Soviets were fighting with the Allies in the war against Germany, they were still neutral with Japan. Stalin did not want a second front to open in the Far East with Japan at a time when Germany was hammering the Soviet Union to the West. Doolittle revised his plan to land the aircraft in China. With the B-25s modified for long-range operations, they were craned onto the deck of the USS Hornet and on the 2nd of April, the ship steamed west. The force from San Francisco, Task Force 18, consists of the USS Hornet aircraft carrier, cruisers Nashville and Vincennes, Euler Cimarron, and destroyers Gwyn, Meredith, Monson, and Grayson. On the 8th of April, the Euler Cimarron refuels the destroyers, whose range is limited, in stormy seas. In Pearl Harbor, Task Force 16, led by Admiral Halsey, puts to sea. Made up of the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier, cruisers Northampton and Salt Lake City, Euler Sabine, and destroyers Balch, Benham, Ellet, and Fanning. The fleet leaves the Navy base and heads towards grid reference 38 North, 180 East. They are to rendezvous with Task Force 18 on the 13th of April, before the combined fleet heads west. Thousands of miles away, off the coast of Japan, the USS submarines Trout and Thresher have been attacking and sinking Japanese merchant shipping. They monitor the weather and feedback radio reports to the fleet. On the 17th, the task force is 800 miles from the Japanese coast. All ships resupply from the oilers Cimarron and Sabine. The two oilers then turn east for home. The destroyers hold at this position to save valuable fuel for the later voyage home. The rest of the task force continues west. The carrier USS Enterprise is providing air cover to the fleet, as the USS Hornet cannot launch any of its own combat wing, while the bombers take up the deck space. Recon aircraft are launched to search an area 200 miles ahead of the fleet for hostile shipping. At 3am on the 18th of April, the fleet detects two surface radar contacts at 20,000 yards distance. Halsey orders a course change away to avoid detection. At 4 a.m., the fleet resumes its course towards Japan. At sunrise, air patrols resume from the Enterprise. 
This time, three Dauntless dive bombers are also dispatched to search for the surface contacts detected overnight. One aircraft sights a ship at 42 miles ahead of the task force, and drops a note onto the deck of the Enterprise so as to preserve radio silence. At 8am, the fleet spots the Japanese patrol craft Nita Maru at 10,000 yards. The USS Nashville opens fire and sinks the craft, but not before it was able to radio back a warning to the Japanese homeland. Enemy carriers spotted. Admiral Halsey realizes the element of surprise has been lost, and every minute passed is a minute longer the Japanese military has to prepare for the attack. Ten hours early, and 170 miles further away than planned, he gives the order to launch the bombers. First into the air, Doolittle leads the 16 B-25 Mitchells in successfully completing the perilous takeoff. Remarkably, no aircraft are lost, and the bombers set course for Tokyo. The task force turns back to the east, knowing there are further patrol craft in the area ready to radio back the location of the fleeing ships to long-range bombers on the mainland. With the B-25s launched, Hornet can now launch its own air wing to help defend the fleet. Over the next few hours, Hornet launches eight Wildcat fighters on combat air patrols, and Enterprise launches Dauntlesses in 200-mile search patterns for enemy ships. Enterprise detects Japanese recon aircraft at long range, but they turn away. At 2 p.m., the fleet spots two patrol craft to the north. Dauntlesses attack and destroy the first, but return fire from the craft damages one Dauntless, which crashes into the sea near the USS Nashville. The Nashville closes in and destroys the remaining ship with the aid of dive bombers from Hornet. To the west, the 16 bombers are approaching the Japanese coast. They split into five formations. The first will hit northern Tokyo, the second central Tokyo, the third southern Tokyo, the fourth spreads out over a 50-mile front on its way to Kanagawa, Yokohama, and Yokosuka Navy Base. The fifth will hit Nagoya and Kobe. The first three flights, 13 aircraft, surround Tokyo and run in from different directions. Hey, I don't know if you heard, but we just had a big development in the unfolding spy. Targets are selected military and civilian factories and oil refineries, notably the Nippon Electric Company and the Mitsubishi Aircraft Company. Japanese observer posts have spotted the bombers crossing the coast, and an intercepting fighter force comprising Zeros, KI-27s and KI-61s have been scrambled. The targets selected are specifically chosen for their scattered nature throughout the Greater Tokyo area. The plan is to cause as much shock to civilians as possible across the widest possible area. Nearly all bombers are pursued and attacked by multiple fighters. Doolittle himself is attacked by nine enemy aircraft. The city's anti-aircraft batteries open a desperate barrage of fire on the bombers, but their low altitude and flight paths make them impossible targets. The gunners on the US aircraft claim five fighters shot down in self-defense. Is a defensive disaster for the Japanese, who score no bombers destroyed. Nearly all planned targets are hit, including damage to an aircraft carrier in dry dock at Yokosuka. Two aircraft attack multiple targets in Nagoya. They encounter heavy anti-aircraft fire before bombing a military barracks, an oil storage facility, and two aircraft factories. The last aircraft follows the coastline into the port of Kobe and drops bombs on a steel works, electric works and the Kawasaki dockyard and aircraft factory. All bombers, except one, turn for China to make their escape. Captain Edward York's aircraft makes for the Soviet Union. An administrative error led to unauthorized modifications to York's engine carburetors before leaving the US mainland. This means that fuel consumption is vastly higher than has been planned for, and China will now be 300 miles out of range. York's crew has no choice but to make for Vladivostok in the Soviet Union. They would eventually land safely, 
but are interned by the Soviet Union. A month later, the Soviet government would stage their supposed escape near the Iranian border, allowing the crew to travel to the British consulate in Iran. The crew would return home soon after, without the Soviets appearing to have broken the neutrality agreement with Japan. All crews are forced to bail out near or before their planned landing areas in China, thanks to unusually high wind and fog. When communicating the plan to the Chinese military in the days leading up to the attack, a mistake was made by US planners. Forgetting that the raid would involve crossing the international date line, the Chinese had been told to await the bombers 24 hours after intended. All but two crews aiming for China returned home with help from the Chinese. Doolittle received the Medal of Honor as leader of the raid. The other two crews were captured by the Japanese. Regretfully, after a military trial, three of the crew members were executed, with another dying of malnutrition in prison. Japanese reprisals on China for harboring the crews were severe, launching Operation Saigo in May to occupy the coastal areas to prevent their use as a bomber landing area again. Estimates for civilian fatalities during the campaign range from 70 to 250,000 people. There was a major boost to American morale. More importantly, the Japanese High Command now considered their coastline vulnerable to attack. They would attempt to take the Pacific Islands of Midway two months later to try to hinder US carrier operations against their mainland in the future. The resulting Battle of Midway would be a crippling defeat for the Japanese Navy and decisive in the war in the Pacific. So I'm going to have some comments for you and you'll have some questions for me. But one of the things that I'd like you to bear in mind was one of the bombers didn't drop its bombs over Japan. I mentioned to you that 15 of the 16 planes delivered their payloads. One of the planes salvoed its bombs, meaning it dropped them into the harbor for fear that the bombs would fall on civilians and that's because they were being pursued by Japanese aircraft and their overhead twin 50 caliber machine guns were out of action. The notion was this was a precision bombing run specifically not to harm any civilians. People uh, in Doolittle's mission before they left said, let's take out the emperor and the high command. And Doolittle said absolutely not, because Doolittle had been in England during the Blitz, helping with British war production, and saw the effect of morale if you attempted to take out their leadership. So he wouldn't allow them to do that. But they had the opportunity. In the after action reports, one of the crews reported flying right over the Imperial Palace, which must have given them quite a sight to see from the ground looking up. The planes came in at such a low altitude that the anti-aircraft guns were virtually unable to get a fix on them. They were passing over too quickly. And the aircraft interceptors flying above couldn't really open fire effectively without killing the people uh, underneath the planes as they were flying over. So they passed effectively without serious opposition um, and, and moved on all safely past Japan and headed on their way to, uh, to China. The question uh, is going to be um, who this man was. He provided America not only a genuine hero, but he was a brilliant strategist, a consummate leader, and possibly the bravest man in uniform. Douglas MacArthur wanted nothing whatever to do with him and rejected efforts to put him in charge of the Western Pacific Theater's combat air operations 
After all, when a general of the army with an unprecedented PR detachment is outshined by a lieutenant colonel, only unpleasantness could be expected from above. <laughs> Recall when Ike was selected commander of Allied Forces Europe, all Mac could offer was best damn clerk I ever had. In spite of MacArthur's efforts to cast Doolittle in the shadow land, Jimmy Doolittle went on to command the 12th Air Force over North Africa, the 15th Air Force over the Mediterranean, and the 8th Air Force over Europe. As a Lieutenant General wearing three stars, Doolittle held the highest rank any reservist on active duty had ever attained. On April 4th, 1985, long after his retirement, Congress honored him with his fourth star presented by President Ronald Reagan. Why was Jimmy Doolittle the right man for the raid? Like me, he was back and forth from active duty to serving in the reserve. Beginning in the 1930s, he was a two-year, two, pardon me, a two-week-a-year reservist holding the rank of Army Air Corps Major. As a reservist, he was employed by both Shell Oil and Curtis Wright Aviation. In 1933, there was a world tour paid for by um, Shell and Curtis Wright so that he could sell airplanes and sell aviation fuel to the Chinese. These are some early pictures of him winning his um, racing awards. This is him as a rising star, the airspeed racing winner and test pilot, always with that contagious smile. Here he is in 1929, pioneering instrument and night flying. What he has in this plane is a canopy of, uh, of blackened canvas that he's gonna pull over him so he can't see out the windows. And for the first time ever in 1929, he is going to show the world that you can fly exclusively on instruments. And this was, of course, instrumental for developing instrument all-weather flying and night flying. There's a picture of him in the U.S. Army Air Service in 1917. Here he is uh, in uh, 1932 with the BG, pardon me, the GB, after setting a flying speed record averaging 252 miles an hour. This was the point at which he retired from being a racing pilot because he said that he had never seen a racing pilot retire um, uh, and pass away from old age. So he decided he was going to give that up. So in 1933, on this trip paid for by Shell and Curtis Wright, he's demonstrating a P-6 Hawk airplane and selling aviation fuel. And this is a picture of the airplane. So 1933, this was the state-of-the-art aircraft that Curtis Wright is pushing. And look just... Uh, six years later at that B-25 Mitchell bomber we were just looking at. Aviation really, really took off uh, in the 20s and 30s, especially in the 30s. Here he is on that trip with uh, Shell providing the, uh, the trip and paying for it. So while he was doing this, he was flying over the coastline of China, looking at what airfields and defenses were being constructed to halt the Japanese advance from Manchuria. He accommodated uh, uh, the, the authorities to allow him to visit Tokyo and specifically noted the importance and location of Tokyo Gas and Electric. He was also in Germany, a center of aviation development in 1930, 1933, 1937, and 1939. Again, he was doing this in his civilian capacity. He couldn't be doing this in his military capacity. He was a close friend of World War I ace Ernst Udet, second only to the Red Baron in the number of Allied kills, and someone even shorter than his intrepid five foot four American friend. Reserve Major Doolittle reported on all he saw to his old boss and head of the Army Air Corps, General Hap Arnold. So did Slim, Doolittle's name for Charles Lindbergh, whose reports on German war production were also critical. In July 19, pardon me, in August 1939, just back from Hitler's Germany. Now, the war started uh, in September 39. So August 39, he's just back from Hitler's Germany. 
and he goes to see Hap Arnold in Washington, D.C., and tells him war is imminent, and he wants to be recalled to active duty. And Hap tells him to hold off until July 1st, 1940, because pending legislation will let him maintain his rank of major. Otherwise, he would have to come back as a captain. In the meanwhile, Doolittle becomes the president of the Institute of Aeronautical Sciences with 3,000 members, which added to his international stature and recognition. Again, he could travel anywhere in the world. France surrendered on June 22nd, 1940. Jimmy Doolittle got a leave of absence from Shell and went back to active duty as a lieutenant colonel, assigned by HAP to supervise air war production at civilian facilities, specifically Allison and Ford. HAP Arnold gave him a personal P-40 to fly among the factories and DC, and then Doolittle went to England to examine and advise on aircraft production. After the war, Jimmy Doolittle goes back to Shell which also provided him his own airplane. And this time he chose a B-25. This is a picture of him with his pal Georgie Patton. Born in Alameda, growing up in the harsh conditions of no Alaska, and so feisty that despite his short arms, he became a successful professional boxer, a graduate of Berkeley and MIT, where he earned the first PhD in aeronautical engineering. Jimmy Doolittle retired to Pebble Beach where he passed away on September 27, 1993 at age 96. In his 30 years of flying from 1917 to 1947, General Doolittle flew 265 different types of aircraft. What became of the Raiders? The weather was clear over Japan, but stormy leaving with benevolent 35 knot tailwinds getting them to the coast of China. Of the 80 raiders, 80 raiders, seven died on the mission, one bailing out, two drowning, three were executed, one dying of Jap in a Japanese prison camp of beriberi and torture. Of the remaining survivors of the Tokyo raid, 13, were killed in action flying on later missions over Europe. Four were shot down and survived as German prisoners of war. So the war didn't end for these brave guys after this mission. They went on and continued to be bomber pilots in some incredibly dangerous missions, some of which were overseen by Jimmy Doolittle. Hap Arnold passed away in 1950, Jimmy Doodle in 1993, and Jimmy's trusted co-pilot on the Tokyo Raid, Dick Hull, just this past April, as I mentioned, at 103. We need to think often of people such as these and take heart from their example, knowing that daring and courage lie within each of us, that we can defeat adversity, and that striving together we can accomplish even the most daunting mission that may await us all. Thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Perfect. Well, welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from St. Francis Yacht Club. Our speaker today, Bruce Janagian, is a lawyer, a Navy captain, and an authority on, the, on Jimmy Doolittle and his daring raid. How did the daring raid of Jimmy Doolittle on Japan's heartland in Tokyo, how did it hurt the Japanese war effort? Well... Up until the raid, the Japanese felt they were uh, impervious to any air attack. So they had really no air defenses organized in a systematic way, and they didn't keep a lot of aircraft at home. With this attack, the Japanese had to protect, protect the home island, which meant diverting resources from the islands that they were aggressively pursuing. It also meant that they had to attack the potential sources of this raid, one of those could have been Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians, 
for land-based aircraft, and one of them could be aircraft carrier-based aircraft coming out of Midway. So they devised a plan to attack Midway uh, two months later, but they diverted some of that uh, force to attack Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians. And by splitting that force, it made our success at Midway more um, uh, opportune. So the range of the bombers, what was the range of the bombers? <clears throat> and what was the plan if the bombers couldn't get to China and land? The range, the, the specifications called for uh, in March of 1939, uh, called for a plane that could travel 300 miles an hour with a range of 1,200 miles. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle modified the airplanes by uh, modifying the carburation so they could burn less fuel, and then he added collapsible fuel tanks inside the fuselages of the planes. So he'd get extra mileage out of them. Even with that, however, because of the extra distance they had to cover, uh, since the the task force was exposed and, uh, and spotted, they were going to have to ditch. And they knew when they left uh, the, the carrier at that point on the Hornet, they were told, should we head back to Pearl Harbor and you know and let you guys scratch the mission? Or are you prepared to launch even though you won't have fuel to make it to, uh, to uh, safety? And, um, and Jimmy Doolittle said, we're going for it. So they left knowing essentially it was a suicide mission. Um, the Hornet, the aircraft carrier Hornet that carried the bombers over, how many bombers were on and how many flighter planes were on the Hornet's deck or on the Hornet? Well, we, we know that there were 16 bombers, and it looked from some of the pictures that we saw that there were four or five uh, aircraft that were uh, the, the regular complement uh, fighters. fighters, but those wouldn't have been able to take off. So effectively, the Enterprise went out to provide the air cover for the Hornet. That's what I wanted to know. So how vulnerable was the Hornet since its own fighter complement couldn't take off because the deck space taken up by the bombers? Yeah, well, it was vulnerable. The people were really disappointed right here looking out on the water and seeing that brand new aircraft carrier, the Hornet, which had just been made. Um, it had just come, from, it was built on the East Coast. It came through the Panama Canal, came up here was in Alameda, and they saw it ferrying aircraft to Hawaii. That's what they assumed. And it was heartbreaking for people here to think that this brand new aircraft carrier was simply being used as a ferry service <laughs> to take bombers. <laughs> Little did they know they were, they were taking an invasion, uh, a bombing force right to Tokyo. I'd like to just mention, I, at the outset, I, I, I mentioned um, the torpedo situation. And this was one of the most heartbreaking things that had occurred. Um, I talked about my heroes group, and I had uh, a PT boat skipper who was with uh, John Kennedy, led the rescue of John Kennedy. All of their torpedoes were duds. Not one of them went off. They risked their lives. They had boats lost, um, and uh, they didn't have one hit because the torpedoes malfunctioned. The submarines, skippers of the submarines, were relieved of their commands because of insufficient tonnage sunk when they fired all of their torpedoes precisely correctly and the torpedoes wouldn't explode. They either exploded prematurely or they hit the ships and then go off. In one case, a submarine fired at three Japanese aircraft carriers and none of them went off. The skippers were literally relieved and replaced and the reports went back to um, Washington and, and there was a, an admiral in charge of this project who swore that it was the fault of the skippers and not the fault of the, the people that designed the torpedoes. The only benefit was for a brief period, the Germans had stolen the plans for our torpedo. <laughs> And it took them a few months to figure out the uh, mistake that they made by using our torpedo. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions, but we'd love to have questions from the audience. So Paul Kamen, our resident naval architect, will be bringing the, the uh, 
the microphone around. So if you have a question, please put your hand up. Paul will get to you. Um, so what were the biggest risks to this plan? If you were to summarize one, two, three, what were the biggest dangers or risks in the mission of the plan? Well, uh, the biggest risk was, was being discovered as they were, and they managed to accommodate that risk. When they left, the weather was abysmal. If you could imagine these planes coming in at very low altitude, you know, literally 50 feet off the surface of the water, they, they, they had window wipers going the whole way. The water spray was in their faces the whole way. The weather was lousy all the way until they reached the coast of Japan, in which case this beautiful sun shining noontime <laughs> sky awaited them. And along with it were the Japanese interceptors. But again, Doolittle's plan was perfect. He, he came in at such a low altitude, they had a very hard time doing anything with the planes. What his plan called for was nighttime flying because he was the guy that perfected the whole means of flying on instruments. So this is what they trained for. They trained for coming in at night on instruments, finding the, the, the lighting patterns of Tokyo because there was no blackout in Tokyo. They felt that they were never going to be bombed. And, uh, and so... You know, that was one of the, the risks, but they accommodated. Again, the flexibility that they showed was, uh, was tremendous. And Doolittle was a risk taker his whole life. After the First World War, these guys were barnstorming pilots. The Army Air Corps, the Army Air Service, which later became the Army Air Corps, were all stunt pilots. The guys that were commanding the bombing of Europe uh, were all, uh, you know, the barnstormers. And they did this to build up a public interest in flying. Flying was such a new endeavor that if the public simply said, well, you know, the war's over, let's just, you know, forget the development of aircraft. We really, we don't see a need for that. It would have been over for our development of advanced aircraft. So they had to get the public interested so that there would be funding from Congress. When we see the Blue Angels flying over San Francisco today uh, during Fleet Week, that's an extension of what was going on right after World War I. The other thing is, in those days, they charged for the ex exhibitions of the aircraft, and the fees that they collected helped pay off World War I uh, indebtedness. So it's a very interesting thing. But Doolittle himself was a barnstormer. All these guys, you know, that were leading these huge waves of bombers were standing on the wingtips. Uh, Doolittle <laughs> rode a plane down on its axle, you know, to, to land as the plane was landing and uh, was filmed doing that in some kind of a, a motion picture. It was very embarrassed that he was, uh, he was found out doing that sort of thing. But that's, what was, <laughs> but that's what was going on. Gordon Danielson has a question. Gordon. Uh, I started thinking about the, the runway space the planes taking off. Now, the first one off had a lot less space or length than the last one taking off. What was the difference in that? And how did they pick the order of the planes going? I would figure they probably had the best pilots maybe uh, going off first and on down. But how, With the how shortest they runway. That? Okay. No, that's exactly right. And the first one off was Jimmy Doolittle. One of the, one of the things when you saw that time lapse, it, it, it made it sound like they all went in in a cluster, but actually they, they just went off on their own. There was radio silence between the planes. They went off on their own. Each one had, knew what it was to do. But, uh, uh, you know, in the after action reports, um, you know, one described seeing another plane for a short period of time and then it diverted to another, uh, another area. Well, Jimmy Doolittle went off first and, um, uh, the um, all the all the planes actually got off the deck successfully. The the range was not um, um, an over um, overburdening uh, problem for these folks. There was one pilot that, in the uh, midst of all of the excitement, forgot to drop his flaps and literally went right off the end of the carrier. And that's the one you see in the movies where he falls down. He's almost in the water, and then he. He pulls up, and that's because he managed to get his flaps down. <laughs> uh, and, and there was one one incident of one of the guys uh, getting the plane ready. He lost his arm when the prop went um, because he, he wasn't anticipating it. But um, 
the people that saw what was going on, first of all, the group in Pendleton um, that knew about the mission, and they weren't told the details, they were basically told it was going to be a suicide mission, and they all volunteered, everyone volunteered. And the people that knew that they were heading out, try, other pilots tried to swap places with them. The excitement of being able to take a shot at the Japan was just uh, overwhelming for these folks. And the other thing is, you know, when you talk about these things being suicide missions, um, at Midway, you know, we launched countless torpedo bombers and, and, and aircraft that were on basically suicide missions. They didn't have enough fuel to come back. They went and they did their duty. Um, the bomber crews over Europe, um, the Army Air Corps bomber crews over Europe took incredible losses um, and uh, day after day after day and they did that. So, But the simple answer is the, the best pilots did take off first and I couldn't give you the numbers of feet that they had, but, but, but they did it. So who in the Pentagon or elsewhere um, in the government had the balls, we're talking about big ones, to decide to pick the test pilot, daredevil, engineer, brilliant Jimmy Doolittle for this raid? Well, that is a great question. Um, Admiral King, Ernest King, uh, was the ultimate decider on that one. And uh, uh, Hap Arnold loved Jimmy Doolittle. Hap Arnold and Jimmy Doolittle were um, together at um, North Island in San Diego. I was just there this past weekend. And you know, you, when you fly into San Diego, you land at Lindbergh Field. Um, and North Island is was Rockwell Airfield. And Hap Arnold, who was taught to fly by Orville Wright, was was the was the, the the commanding officer of Rockwell Field when Jimmy Doolittle came aboard uh, under his command? Jimmy Doolittle was always getting in trouble. He <laughs> flaunted all the uh, uh, all the rules, and uh, but Hap realized what an incredible pilot this guy was, um, and uh, you know managed to stand by him every time the. Um, he switched, uh, that is, from active duty to reserve and then back to active duty. Hap Arnold gave him a promotion. So he <laughs> was promoted ahead of all these guys who stayed on active service. Um, there, was a, a, there was a couple a couple of other names, Carl Spatz, sometimes called Carl Spatz. But does anybody know Carl Spatz? Carl Spatz, S-P-A-A-T-Z. Carl Spatz headed all of the um, U.S. air efforts in Europe. And Eisenhower said that the two greatest contributions to the war, to winning the war in World War II, were Carl Spatz, that nobody's heard of, and, um, and um, the general that was always in the shadow of Patton because he was, he was not such a tall figure and he was not the most telegenic human being. Do you know who I'm talking about? The general that was Omar Bradley. The two generals that won the war in Europe were Carl Spatz in the air and Omar Bradley on the ground. And look around for pictures of these guys. The one that had the least effect was Douglas MacArthur who had the PR campaign and, and Douglas MacArthur, if you ever want to, to hear about, you know, his, the sad reality of Douglas MacArthur is, you know, he was a disaster and he took credit for what Nimitz achieved. There was a moment, I'm going to say this because it's true. Douglas MacArthur extorted $500,000 out of Manuel Quezon, who was the head of the Philippines in order to be released from the tunnel that they were in in Corregidor, MacArthur wouldn't allow him to leave until he gave MacArthur personally $500,000. This has been confirmed as true. And, and Macar I mean, um, FDR, FDR gave MacArthur the Medal of Honor to shut him up and get him out of his hair because because 
Douglas MacArthur undercut every single thing that FDR was doing. Also, the evolution of air power was completely dependent on the efforts of Billy Mitchell. Douglas MacArthur convicted Billy Mitchell at his court martial. They were boyhood friends. And Douglas MacArthur was absolutely counterproductive in preparing the war. If you look at the history of, of uh, the Philippines in the beginning of the war, Douglas MacArthur violated every order that he had to defend the Philippines. He did nothing. Uh, it was a, it was a, a scandalous situation, and and FDR wanted to court martial him, but said we need a hero. We don't need a court martial at the beginning of the war. Yes, another question from the audience. Um, actually, a comment. A few years ago, a couple of uh, my friends and I were able to fly in a B twenty five in the Bay Area, and and buzz the current Hornet, which is over in Alameda, and uh, that's <clears throat> available every May. The Collings Foundation. Uh, comes down to Moffett Field and people can fly that. My question is, uh, the Mitchell, as far as I know, is the only bomber named after a person. And why is that? Well, there's there's two Mitchells. The, the first, there's a Mitchell Field on the East Coast, and um, that was named after former mayor of New York with the last name Mitchell. And it was named for him because he turned his uh, biplane over upside down and slipped out because they were, didn't have seat belts in those days. That's when they, that's when they learned they needed seat belts. They didn't, they didn't have, they didn't have, they didn't have parachutes until the 1930s. Uh, you know, I mean, these guys were, were, were barnstormers. Um, why they named it after Mitchell was because Mitchell was the only person that deserved <laughs> to have it named after him. That's all I can say. I thought it might be Billy Mitchell. Yeah, that's Billy Mitchell. Yeah. Okay, Billy Mitchell. How many B-25s exist today? You know, they, they kept in service for some time in a number of countries. Uh, I couldn't tell you the number. Um, so what motivated Doolittle? Was he at all money motivated? Interesting. Um, everybody needs to take care of their family. You should understand that Jimmy Doolittle, when he had this raid, had a son joining the Army Air Corps and flying as a fighter pilot in World War II. So here's Jimmy Doolittle, whom we think of as this young, you know, uh, uh, daring raider, and his son is actually flying in World War II also, which is quite amazing. He did take a threefold increase in pay when he left the um, active service and, and you know, picked up fees from Shell and Curtis Wright uh, as a civilian. But he wasn't out for the money as much as he was taking care of the family. And the pay before World War II, the pay for the service uh, members was pitiful. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing we retained people as we did. Um, uh, the pay was just, was just lousy. So he left, but he stayed in the reserve and he stayed, you know, loyal to Hap Arnold. And as I mentioned, even as a reservist, he was doing things for the government. If it wasn't for him and Lindbergh reporting back on all the developments they were privy to in, um, the Far East and in uh, Germany, uh, the government would not have been as aware of uh, the, those activities. Now, you're spent, you spend volunteer energy around the Navy League. Talk to us about the Navy League and why this is an important institution. Um, I will on the condition that Angus Blackwood stands up. Angus is right here. Angus is the president of our San Francisco Navy League. And we, we, this town was the center of the war in the Pacific as far as the west coast of the United States. I mean, the, the fleet that was down in San Diego moved to Pearl Harbor, as you know, before the war began. But all of the shipyards, all of the activity in the San Francisco Bay was supported by the Navy League. And the Navy League raised a lot of money, supported the fleet, uh, and has 
maintained its presence in the Bay Area over the years and needs a revitalization, which Angus, supported by myself and some others, are going to be undertaking. And we're going to be um, looking to all of you to get involved once again with the Navy League. San Francisco is a Navy town, whether it knows it or not. <laughs> So I have to thank our speaker, too, because uh, I've known since my father told me at age 19 that, of course, that he survived the sinking of the Vincents in Guadalcanal. And he told the story once, and I've told it to at this group. Um, but I did not know that the Vincents, I didn't know how he got out there. And so I learned from our speaker that, yes, the Vincents was part of the a group, uh, the fleet that actually took out Doolittle's Raiders. And um, what's interesting about... Uh, people who were basically heroes in World War II, and my dad was a gunner's mate, the second gun of the Vincennes, and he described getting hit by all three torpedoes and them staying on their gun inside the turret, kept shooting it until they were finally given, um, you know, the signal to abandon ship, and he jumped, of course, like everybody, off the side as far as he could, and essentially, after two torpedoes, the ship was still list was starting to list, and they could feel it. By the way, from the first torpedo to the sinking was 40 minutes. Just think about that. My dad stayed in position with all these guys, and they did not think of themselves as war heroes. He did, refused that. When I would say dad was a hero because he, no, he couldn't get on a life raft. He had to hold on for two nights uh, until they were survived while people holding on to the life rafts because there was not enough room on them were being eaten by sharks. And they wouldn't move. My dad said they wouldn't move because if you moved, you thought you'd be more likely, uh, you know, to be eaten by one of these sharks. And this went on day and night, day and night. But every time I would say my dad was a hero, he survived the sinking. He'd say, no, no, I wasn't a hero. We all, we all were there together. And so I want to thank our speaker today for bringing to our attention the incredible, thoughtful, br technically brilliant, and thoughtful effort of Jimmy Doolittle and all the guys in that generation. Thank you so much, Bruce Janagian, for being a guest of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. Thanks, mate. Good.